You're seeing some smoke coming from the Twin Towers. We're at the George Washington Bridge right now. Lots of smoke coming from that direction. We're on our way to go check that out. I'm Brian McKinley in the Bloomberg 1130 Chopper. This, just in, you were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot. There. Apparently a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center. And we could see the smoke, and we could see the smoke was getting thicker. A huge gash in the building itself. There is black and gray smoke pouring out of it right now. We're climbing up to 1100, and a plane flew by on the right side, less than a half a mile away from us, and under us, and it dipped and then turned. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yeah. can see it on the shot. We were blaring on the horn, you know, practically driving on the sidewalk. I ran as fast as I could. This is this sort of desperate ride to the scene. So I, I, was, I got out of the car, I told the driver, okay, you stay here, I'm gonna go see if I can find a camera crew because they had dispatched crews without reporters just to get them down there. Everybody came from all different directions. John Del Giorno is in News Chopper 7, and uh, John, good to have you on the line. John, what can you tell us? Then you start John, are you with us? trying to find the balance between being a reporter and being a person. We are currently hovering just uh, north of Midtown Manhattan. We're over the west side of Manhattan here at 79th Street, looking south towards the World Trade Center. Just an absolutely staggering sight as both towers of the World Trade Center are currently billowing in smoke. I was somewhat in disbelief because I'm at the staging area for the fire department and there's no media there. We are the only crew. Quick, quick. You gotta go out. Grab your guy and get him out. Don't kill me. Come on, Marty. I don't care. I don't care. Get out. I was trying to shoot what was going on around me, but I was also absolutely horrified at what I was seeing. People were jumping. I saw people hanging out of the windows. I was shooting it. I was at a loss professionally. And this officer says, I'm sorry, I can't let you go any further. And I've got my press pass out, you know, and I'm completely indignant. You know, I'm a reporter. I have to get there. The mayor's there. The mayor's in Seven World Trade. You got to let me through. And she's like, I'm sorry, we're not letting anybody through. I'm doing this to protect your life. We don't know what's going to happen next. She's this big officer. And I start to argue with her, and it was like it was on cue. As soon as she said, I'm doing this to protect your life, the Southern Tower goes down. And I just, I was in shock. And I just thought, I better get this on tape. And I just, I turned on my recorder, and I just held the mic out. The building is falling right now. People are running through the street. Smoke is everywhere. People are filling Lower Broadway. And I remember Newton asking me for uh, to say that he wanted to do a stand-up. All right, take one. Take one and two. One. This is as close as we can get. He to told me, he says, me, the firefighters, and tilt up to the building, which I did. I asked for another one, as I always do, because you never know. It could be a crease in the tape, whatever. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firefighters. And as I tilted up, you can see the two towers, a huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. I don't remember whether I was rolling or not. I wasn't at work anymore. I was running for my life. I was running and running, and I said, I'm dialing, trying to dial this phone. I got nothing. You could be, uh, you know, a 9-9 nine -nine in a 100-meter dash. You couldn't outrun this thing. I had to do all I could to run to get away from all the debris. Me and a number of other people here are trapped in the subway here in a shoe store, actually trying to get away from most of the debris. Uh, it's just an incredible sight. They had a lot of emergency workers around the building, and, of course, everybody's hoping that these people were able to get out of there without being injured. But it is a surreal and devastating scene over here, something like I've never seen before. My cell phone's not working, can't get any instructions. We can't get in our building because it's been evacuated. And um, I run into Beth. Marianne! Marianne, don't go! Okay, okay, don't go! And I turned off the tape recorder and I, I just start crying. That's when it just hit me. But I knew I'd seen thousands of people die in the most unbelievable way. Having Marianne there with me, having a colleague with me, every time one of us could get upset, we knew we could count on the other. 
I could not have made it that day without her. I absolutely am convinced of that. Beth Fertig and I have both been talking to people who are sort of escaping from this uh, amazing disaster, and they've told us stories about um, being in the building when the first explosion happened, uh, coming down all the way down 87 flights of stairs in the building and getting out just, just before hearing the top of the building collapse. I felt people pull me back, and our backs were up against a phone bank. I heard the crash come down, and someone yelled clear. It was a firefighter. I felt firefighter fatigues around me. And then we ran. Out. Newton was right there to try to help me, help tell the story. He jerked me back to start working as a team again. Watch, rolling all this mess down. People are hysterical. And I responded. We saw people coming out that were covered in debris. What happened? What did you see? Trying to get an understanding of what had just happened. I heard a plane, low, and then I saw flames. I saw flames engulf the whole upper portion, and then I saw the smoke, and then we saw the people jumping. We saw what we thought was debris, and we realized it was people jumping. I can't do any more. We were crying. <laughs> interviewing her. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We are back now with Marianne McCune and uh, Beth Fertig, who have uh, been out on the streets this morning. And we're still on the air when I hear another rumble. And I felt it in my feet. When I heard the rumble that I had heard the first time, I knew they were identical. Oh my God, there it goes! held as long as I could, that I felt I was safe, and then I ran for my life. As soon as we got off the boat, uh, we were at the World Financial Center Marina, and uh, that was only a block or two from the World Trade Center, so we were real close. And a fire chief came over and was really angry with us and he had us ushered out of the area by police and he had threatened us that if he saw us again he was going to have us arrested. So we just, you know, we took that into consideration and just found another way. Getting the pictures and recording this was the goal here and I had never quite felt such a strong um, desire to reach that goal as I did that day and as I think most journalists did. Sure enough, uh, without much trouble at all, we were right at ground zero, and it was unbelievable. Uh, there was mangled metal everywhere, crushed cars, ambulances, fire trucks, and everything was covered with dust. There was virtually no color anywhere. Everything had this white film of dust on it, plus the air was cloudy from all the smoke. It was monochromatic. It was surreal, unlike anything you could ever imagine. And uh, I was, you know, prepared to be kicked out of the area at any moment. So I was working real fast, uh, shooting just about anything that I thought was important. And that's when I noticed these three firemen were climbing up on top of the wreck, the wreckage. And I realized that they were raising a flag. So I'm about 100 yards away, perhaps less. And I'm making a long lens picture of them raising this flag. As the flag is going up, I can kind of see a similarity with the Iwo Jima picture, which many people have compared it to. Visually, it is similar. Uh, I had no idea that it would have any kind of impact, certainly not the impact or the comparisons with that famous photograph by Joe Rosenthal. It's a patriotic picture. It's a picture about heroicism. It's a picture about hope in the shadow of this horrible, horrible tragedy. It was a brutal story to try to report. It was the emotional grief was overwhelming. There was hundreds of people waiting for their loved ones who were never going to come home. And I just found it really difficult to tell that story in light of what I had just been through and seen. We saw a shadow, it looked like a plane. Next thing we know it was boom, boom, and the floor started shaking. And then we saw debris fall down, and next thing we know we had to get out of the building. And we stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. Journalists, I think, shined because most of the information that you saw from live reports that were at the scene that day were reporters 
looked at were going with what they had, what they knew, what they saw, what they were able to gather. It was a battlefield condition, but it was really reporting news as it happened. It just went ba boom, it was like a bomb went off. And it was like, it was like holy hell coming down them stairs. I had never cried on an assignment before, and I cried half a dozen times that day uh, just for, not so much for what I saw, but what, for what this meant and how our lives would never be the same and, you know, what life would be like from this point on. It was the end of the world. It was the end of my world. It was the end of New York's world. It was the end of all of our world. You know, everything that we thought was safe was gone. And I kept thinking, what are they going to do to us next? A few days after uh, all this was when we found out the fate of those people who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. The people who were in those buildings up until that point had no faces, no names. You didn't know them. Well, I met their families and children all at once, one afternoon. 25 to 30 families all lined up with pictures of their loved ones. That's when it really hit me. Hi. What's your name? Jack Lloyd Fergio. Okay. Um, is this a picture of your dad? Yes. It's my father. His name is David Fergio. David. And he wears a, a gold cross and has a big letter T. The pictures were on telephone poles, light poles. I mean, it was rough because you really have to participate and feel that emotion in, in a story. And we were wrecked. America was attacked on September 11th. One of the first obligations uh, that the network has is for public service. I think all the networks, all the media responded and did nothing but give it straight coverage, gave it the coverage it deserved. Everyone should be proud of that.